consider Christ the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to the tree. My Lord. Well, hello there. Welcome to our online service. My name's Ez and I'm the Associate Minister at St. Luke's Liverpool. If you're new here, a special welcome to you. We're glad that you've joined us here today. Today, Paul Grimmond, Dean of Students and Lecturer at Moore Theological College, is our guest preacher. But before we hear God's word, let's sing together. Please join us. Consider Christ the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to the tree. My Lord.
Let's pray before we hear God's word. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word, that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Bible reading is from Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Hi everyone, Ed here, Children's Minister. Thursday was a special day in our family. My little precious turned 10, Nathaniel. Now parents know just what it's like to love their kids and to do anything for them. If any of my boys were in trouble, what would I do? Well, I would go and rescue them. So if Nala the cheetah was to attack Charlie, well, I would get in there and I would put my life on the line to rescue Charlie. If Bingo the Dingo was having a go at Nathaniel, well, I would get in there and get in between and I would try and rescue Nathaniel, no matter what. If Niall the Crocodile, and that is his name by the way, was going to attack Sammy, then I'd get in there and I would try and stop this crocodile from getting my little boy. And you know what? I think your parents would do anything to rescue you as well. Well, Jesus actually does something even better than that. See, what he does is he rescued us not because we're lovely little children, or lovely people, uh, he rescued people even when they did the wrong thing against him. So when people turned their backs on him and said, go away, God, get lost. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Well, Jesus died for them. Now, in Romans chapter 5, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now that's Jesus Christ that that's talking about. Jesus the King. Now he doesn't rescue us from Nala the Cheetah or Bingo the Dingo or Nile the Crocodile, even though I think he would if he needed to. He doesn't do that. He rescues us from something which is far worse in the long run. He rescues us from sin and from the punishment of sin. And so Jesus takes the punishment for our sin and he died for us. 
And remember that again, what it said, that while we were still sinners, while we were still turning our backs on him, while we didn't want to listen to him, Jesus decided that he would die for us. And that is something that I think we should be very thankful for. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus loves us so much and that you love us so much, that you both had a plan to send him to us, uh, to rescue us from sin and to rescue us from the punishment that comes with sin, And and that's death. We thank you that you sent Jesus to do that and that by your Holy Spirit we can trust Jesus. And we thank you that he did it even when we hadn't turned back to you. Help us all be thankful and grateful for the good thing that you have done for us all the days of our lives. Amen. Be still and know God. Over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about finding freedom and finding rest. And each time we've seen that Jesus comes offering us these things by bringing us the truth about God, it's something totally different from what the world tells us will be normal. But at the heart of all of Jesus' teaching is the idea that freedom and rest and all of the good things we have come in relationship with God himself. And so in this last talk, I want to talk a little bit about why knowing God will change your life. Like not just in a small way, in a radically turn it upside down and change everything kind of way, but in a way that's better than anything that you can possibly imagine. Uh, And he introduced you to how much it changes life. I wanted to show you this this one little phrase from the passage that we've just read today. Romans chapter 5 verse 3. It says that for people who know God, they can do this. We can glory in our sufferings. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems to me to be utterly stupid. Um, I I go to my fair share of 18th and 21st birthday parties. I go to weddings. I go to kind of, you know, people's retirement things. And and if you're going to glory in something, what we glory in is achievement. The things that you've succeeded in, the the goals that you've kicked, the, the ways that you've won people, the things about you that are beautiful and shiny and bright. What we glory in when we gather with each other and celebrate each other is the things that we can do. Whereas this passage says that when you know God, you don't glory in that. What you get to glory in is when life's difficult and when you suffer. Now, friends, that is utterly remarkable and I think completely unbelievable unless you've understood God's logic about the way the world works. And what we're going to do is we're going to delve into this little passage and see God's logic about the way the world works when you know God through Jesus. So I want to pick it up with you right at the start of the passage, chapter 5 and verse 1. He says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I don't know about you, but there's enough Christian jargon words in those two sentences to keep most Christians confused. Um, Let me try and stop and put it into plain English for you. He starts with the word therefore because he's about to reach a conclusion for for a kind of argument that's been going on for several chapters. And the argument's basically this. We are all sinful. We all know God's there, but we don't always treat him as God or respect him as God. And because of that, every single one of us when we stand before God in judgment, he's actually going to deserve his judgment and his wrath. But Romans chapter 3 argues that God gave up Jesus as the punishment for the forgiveness of our sins so that anybody, doesn't matter what your religious background, whether you've got a religious background or not, wherever you've come from, you can be right with God, not because of anything that you've done, but because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. And therefore, at the start of chapter 5, therefore, since we have been justified, declared right through trusting in Jesus, he says we now stand in a new situation. And that situation is described by these two words. We have peace with God uh, 
And there is a space of grace, verse 2, in which we now stand. Now, those two words describe something beautiful about being in relationship with God. There's a peace now that is about restored relationship. Now, you kind of know what peace is, right? Peace is that moment um, when you've had a four-year-old birthday party in your house and you've had two hours worth of little children running and screaming at each other, hyped up by red cordial and sugar, and all of a sudden there's that moment when everybody goes home and it's like the whole place breathes and everything stops. Peace is when all of the noise and everything is gone, but it's more than that. Peace is when the fight's finished. Peace is when you've been arguing with somebody and someone owns up and you finally get restoration and the relationship returns to normal. Peace is when the storm has stopped and everything becomes still. In Jesus, we have peace with God. The other word that gets used here is the idea of grace. We stand in grace or we stand in a place of grace. Now, grace is a beautiful word. It describes a gift that's given to you. Not just a gift, you know, when it's your birthday and people have to give you a present. But grace describes a gift that you didn't earn and it wasn't in any way special. Just someone's given to you out of the goodness of their own heart. We stand in a place of of grace. We've been given a gift by God. But this place of grace, this gift from God, describes something about our relationship with him. And I think the word describes that kind of sense when you're in a relationship. You know when you know that you are known and loved and accepted in spite of anything that you can do. When someone is just with you and for you no matter what and they love you as you are. Grace is about a place of total security. It's kind of that picture, you know, when you see sometimes young children on the top of the fort and they go, Dad, catch me, and they just fling off into space, knowing that there will be someone there to catch them. This place of grace is the description of knowing that with God, even when we get it wrong, there's someone who will love us and catch us and hold us secure. It's a place of absolute freedom and joy and rest because there's a security that cannot be broken by anything in all of the world. The passage is saying, therefore, because of what Jesus has done, you stand at peace with God and in a place of grace and rest and security. But not just do you have kind of this space that guarantees you are now, there's also a guarantee about the future, verse 2. We now boast in the hope of the glory of God. We stand in a relationship now where we don't just know what we've got now, but we're looking forward to a future which is really, really good. Now, friends, there's a moment in every year when we all know what kind of boasting in hope looks like. You know, there's the footy season, there's the soccer season, whatever it is. When you get to the final series, if your team is still in it, you notice people going on and boasting about their hope in glory. Our team can do it. Our team can get there. We're going we're gonna to win the premiership and you're all hopeless. And, and one of the really interesting things about that is, do you notice that everybody does it? You wear your team's colours and you go around saying, we won and we can do it. Of course, the reality is you can't. In fact, were you on the field, the likelihood of success drops to almost zero. When we say we won, we don't mean that. We mean actually someone else won on our behalf. But we boast in the hope that we will share in the glory of what they achieve. Well, in Romans 5.2, the passage is saying we are actually boasting of sharing in all of the glory of the perfection and goodness of God revealed in all of its fullness on the last day. And that's a description of a world where there's no more pain, where there's no more suffering, there's no more death. A world where actually you can do what you intend to do, where love is never tainted by our jealousy and our lust and the evil things that come within us, a world that's completely perfected and restored. And that's such an important hope, isn't it? Because of what life is like in this world. Um, Over the last kind of three and a half years in my own life, um, I've had a string of real issues with my health. Um, It all started, I I dislocated my kneecap playing cricket on the beach with some mates. Uh, Turned out that I actually had to have surgery because I'd knocked all the cartilage and part of the underside of my kneecap off and they had to kind of get bits out of there. 
And then in the recovery from that, I um, ended up with a DVT, a kind of clot in my leg, which took months of medication to get rid of. Uh, and I also ended up back in casualty because another medication that I'd taken messed with my liver, and so I spent another kind of night in the hospital. Um, that all kind of healed itself, and kind of 12 months later, I was kind of getting towards the end of all of that. Um, when I went through an, a, another period, um, this is something that's not kind of appropriate to declare in public, so if you can keep this between you and me, I'd appreciate that, but um, I actually ended up at the point where I had he needed to have hemorrhoid surgery, and my only advice to you is if anyone ever offers you hemorrhoid surgery, that you turn and run screaming in the other direction and don't let them anywhere near you. Um, for me, it was excruciating. I had about 12 months worth of pain and bleeding and other things, but in the midst of that, in the recovery, about two months into the recovery, I actually had a massive internal bleed, uh, which led them to go investigating, and they found out that I had a very rare kind of tumour in my small intestine. So I ended up in hospital. I had two metres of my small intestine taken out. Um, in the recovery from that, I ended up in hospital a couple of other times with pain. Um, I thought everything was finally kind of over and getting well. About 12 months later, um, I was on holidays with my family at the beach, packing the trailer at the end of camping, and I noticed this discomfort in my stomach. Uh, turns out that I'd actually gotten a hernia in the repair line from the previous surgery. My stomach started to bulge out, and I went into surgery again. Uh, post that surgery, I had another round of DVT and ended up in hospital again. And in the same period of kind of two years, I've also discovered that I have a really rare eye condition. So I have parts of my retinas have been burnt out. I can't see bits of my peripheral vision. The disease has stopped at the moment, uh, but they know that sometimes it can restart and they don't know why. And so there's a possibility at some point in the future that my vision will disappear. Now, I don't tell that story in order to kind of garner your sympathy, but rather to acknowledge that we live in a world where this is just life for people. And one of the things that I've noticed is as I've gone through this period of kind of pain for myself, it's actually opened my eyes to how many people live like this so much of the time. Uh, where I go to church, there are lots of dearly beloved older saints, 80, 90. Um, and I've realised as I talk to them more, their life looks like what my life's looked like through this patch every day of their life. Um, for all of us, as we look towards the end of life, the reality is that we are broken and we live in a broken place. Uh, and that's been brought home with such stark reality into our own lounge rooms and living rooms by the pandemic, hasn't it? The fact that all of life can be stopped, that people can lose their jobs, that the future can just be yanked away and we don't know who's going to be affected or who's going to live and who's going to die. Friends, actually hope is essential to being human. And what this passage says is that for people who know Jesus, you stand in such a place with God that your hope is that you will enjoy all the blessings of the future. Now, here's the fundamental question. Is that hope certain? Can you bank on it? Is it worth giving up your life for the sake of that hope? That's really the big question. And it's actually the question that Paul wants to deal with in the rest of this passage. Come back with me into the passage, verse 5. He wants to say to you, hope doesn't put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love poured into our hearts is the promise that this future can be trusted. That what we hope in is not some mist. We won't be, get there and be put to shame, but it's real and it's certain. How does God's love make certain that future of the promise? Well, that's the logic of the passage, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The logic of the passage goes like something like this. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous person. Okay, a really good person, an upright moral person who's a stranger walking past, are you going to lay down your life for them? Probably not. 
He says, sometimes someone might for a good person die. Now, the good person uh, in the original probably refers to someone who was like your kind of benefactor under the old Roman system, the person who was your patron, who provided for your living and you worked in their household and they kind of supplied your livelihood. For the person that that you owed your life to, you might be willing to die for them. And just occasionally in our human experience, we see that. Uh, in May 2011, there were a massive series of tornadoes swept through kind of southwestern Missouri. Uh, and Don and Bethany Lansaw uh, were a couple living in a small town there. Um, they'd heard the warnings that the storm was coming and they prepared the house as best they could. They, you basically try to put away everything that can't be nailed down. You lock everything that you can. Uh, and the final thing you do is you go and you lie in something secure, so the bottom of the bathtub, and you put the cushions and the blankets over the top of you to ride it out. Um, Bethany describes what happens next. She said that the, the storm hits, and she said it's like being right next to the loudest freight train you've ever heard roaring past. She said you can feel and sense that the whole world is breaking up, and there's stuff whirling around about you in the air, and the noise is unbelievable, but it lasts for such a short time, and then all of a sudden it's gone, and the silence comes back. She says, in the silence, she started to realise that something was wrong. See, she'd lain in the bottom of the bathtub. Her husband had laid on top of her. They had the blankets over her. But as she tried to start moving, her husband wasn't moving. There was actually a blue tinge around his lips. And within not many minutes, he would actually be dead. With tears in her eyes, she spoke to the TV reporters afterwards about her husband. And she said this. He just has so much love in his heart. And, you know, people keep saying that he wouldn't have wanted it any other way, but if I could have taken twice as much damage to have him alive, I would have. He got on me to take the brunt of most of it. You know, he's my hero. Sometimes in our life, someone does something exceptional for someone who's very close to them. But it's rare. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. For a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. You know, I'd like to think that I would give up my life for my family or my kids if it came to it. I don't know if I'd be brave enough or if I'd have the capacity or courage to do it. But here is what is absolutely and utterly outrageous. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And just in case you've missed it, he repeats it again, two verses later, verse 10. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. While we were sinners, while we were out of relationship with God, while we were enemies, while we were ignoring God and telling God, look, you know, it's nice that you're there. I'd like to do my own thing. Thanks very much. God knowing us in all of our brokenness didn't wait for us to sort it out or to ask for forgiveness or to come back to him, but he actually gave up Jesus for us and for our forgiveness and our reconciliation. And you see, in there lies the promise of God and the logic, which means that we are certain of our hope. Verse 10, if while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more? Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Jesus has been raised from the dead. He sits at God's right hand. And we, even though we die, the Bible promises that we will come to God at the end. And Jesus will welcome us home, forgiven and made clean, into all of the hope of the new creation. The argument of this passage is that you can know the certainty of the hope of the future because of what God has done in Jesus in the past. Do you want to know that this hope, this promise of life and a future in a new creation is real? You've got to get to know Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never read the story of Jesus' life, grab a Bible and turn to the book of Mark and read the life of Jesus. And actually, you can know that that story of Jesus' life is not just a story, it's a history. It's the truth about the Jesus who walked and lived in the world that you and I live in. Now, there's a great little book that I want to commend to you. It's called, Can We Trust What the Gospels Say About Jesus? 
written by an historian explaining how we know that what's written in the Bible about Jesus is actually true. I mean, incredibly, do you know that a number of the people who followed Jesus, the 12 disciples, a bunch of them died alone in other parts of the world or got put in prison because they'd seen Jesus die and be raised again to life. You don't make up a story and go to prison for it 20 years later. You don't make up a story and go and give up your life uh, for the sake of a guy that you think that you've actually told a lie about. The disciples lived their whole lives as if this was true and the truth about it spread through the ancient world and these guys wrote down what they saw and heard Jesus say. And what God has done in Jesus in the past is the promise that the future cannot be taken away. But here is the beautiful thing, verse 3. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. The God who has promised us the future in the resurrection of Jesus will use even our sufferings to grow us and shape us like him and make us ready to be with Jesus there on the last day. And friends, I want to point out to you that this is a hope that's so different from what the world tells you is true. I don't know if you ever listened to the the line of the atheist, the the world that seems to just say, look, this is all there is. Um, There's no tomorrow. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow you die. Um, Actually, the hope that they offer you is no hope at all. There are a number of famous atheists. I've just chosen one quote from a guy called Richard Dawkins, but you may know of many others. But actually, when you strip away the reality of what they're saying about the world, this is what they're saying, and this is in his own words. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, Nothing but pitiless indifference. The best that atheism has to offer you, the best that a worldview that says there's no God, there's no future, there's no hope, you're just a product of evolution and you'll die and that's the end of it. The best that you can be told in the midst of suffering is bad luck. That's really what he says. Some people are going to get hurt and some people are going to get lucky. Either you're playing a lottery, and actually in this lottery, everybody loses because everybody lies. Or there's actually a meaning and significance to the world because God has made it, and there is a hope that is true that you can see the reality of because of what God has done in the past in Christ. And in the hands of a God who is that good, we can glory in our sufferings. Doesn't make suffering comfortable or easy, or nice. But what we know is that when we suffer, when people who know God suffer, God is with us, and he reshapes us, and he grants us resilience, and he grows us in wisdom, and he helps us to develop self-control, and he actually makes people who are shaped by his truth into beautiful people. You know those older saints that I told you about before, those people in their 80s and 90s that come to my church? They are deeply beautiful people. Not because they're naturally good, but because God has worked in them to cling to him, even in the toughest times in life. And so I want to finish by introducing you to a man from history. His name is Horatio Gates Spafford, which tells you that he wasn't born in the 21st century. Uh, He was a prominent wealthy lawyer who lived in Chicago And tragedy struck him not once, but many times. Uh, In 1870, his only son, aged four, died of scarlet fever. So could you imagine that? Your four-year-old is taken away from you. The year after that was the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Uh, Gates had invested most of his fortune in property. Uh, All of it was burnt down in the fire in 1871. And so he lost most of his wealth. But he and his wife decided to stay in the city. 300 people died and 100,000 people became homeless in that fire. 
and they worked away in the city to try and help others and whatever. And after a couple of years, almost at the point of exhaustion, they decided to travel to Europe to visit family and to have a bit of a rest. Uh, their passage was booked on a French ship called the Ville de Havre. And uh, at the last minute, uh, Horatio was actually kind of held up in Chicago on business. So his wife and his four daughters got on the boat, but he didn't. Four days into his journey, in the middle of the night, that ship struck another ship in the middle of the Atlantic and went down. And almost everybody on the ship died. His wife was one of the few people rescued. She was plucked out by a boat that took her onto Europe. And Gates, not knowing any of this happened, basically received a telegram from his wife that said, saved alone, what should I do? He got straight on a ship and sailed to the other side of the Atlantic to be with his wife. And while on board that ship, he wrote what has now become one of the most famous hymns in English tradition. It's called, It Is Well With My Soul. Here's a man who had lost most of his wealth and all of his five children, and this is what he says about knowing God. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to know, it is well. It is well with my soul. He says through good or ill, through the best or worst of times, when the absolute awful comes along, it is well with my soul. Why? Second verse, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his blood for my soul. I know that whatever happens, I am in a place of security with God because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so what does he live for? Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight, when the clouds be rolled back like a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Friends, the logic of this passage is the logic of Gates' song, which he knew in the midst of his darkness and suffering that there was a God who made the world, that there was a God who had a sure and certain future and a God who would hold him. And he knew it because he knew that Jesus has died for his forgiveness. And so I want to invite you to come to God. I want to invite you to cry out to him and to pray to him and to ask him for forgiveness and to ask him to come into your life and be the Lord of your life, knowing that he actually guarantees you a future and a hope and a certainty in, in what's to come in the guarantee that even in the sufferings of this life, he will hold you and work in you to make you more like Christ. So I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to invite you to pray it, to ask God to be in control of your life. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that it is possible to know how much you have loved us because you sent Jesus to die for us. Sorry that I have lived as your enemy. Sorry for the ways in which I have hurt others and hurt you. Please forgive me and change me to live with Jesus as the one in control of my life. Please help me to know you and to have certain hope of the future. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, God has heard you and you stand in new relationship with him. Get in touch with someone. Talk to people from the church maybe that you're watching the video from and find out more about the certainty of the hope that's yours in Jesus. Now, I'm hoping that some of you have found some people to watch our online service with so that you can actually have some time of fellowship over some real morning tea. But if you're just in your own place, uh, we'd love for you to join us for our online morning tea. So in a moment, hop off YouTube or Facebook 
and hop onto Zoom. It doesn't matter if you've never joined us before, we'd love to see you. And especially if you've been struck by the good news you've heard today, we'd love for you to get in touch with us and tell you more about Jesus. Just go to our website, that's www.stlukesliverpool.org.au to connect with us. But for now, keep safe, God bless, and we'll see you next week. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to the tree. My Lord. Sufficient love